All right, we're going to get going with the uh, with the next session now. So welcome back, everybody. And we're going to give uh, Ruth a bit of a rest. Um, and I'm not going to make any rugby jokes. I grew up in England, and I had to play rugby as a, as a th little tiny skinny kid, and I hated rugby, and I've hated it ever since. So I'm certainly not going to be breaking my hand. All right, our first speaker of the next se session then is Dr. Paul Heathersay, who leads the South Australian Department for Energy and Mining. Paul uh, joined the South Australian government in 2002, and after working for over 20 years in the mining industry across Australia, Southeast Asia, and China, he was awarded a Public Service Medal for Outstanding Service Enabling Growth of the State's Mineral Sector in 2012, and is an elected fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences. We're very happy and very privileged because we know you have a really busy schedule. So we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Paul Heathersay to the stage today. Thanks very much for that. Um, First of all, I'd also just like to acknowledge we're on Ghana country and acknowledge uh, Elders past, present and emerging. So thanks for the opportunity to come and chat to you today. Um, I, the topic is around the university's role in the State Prosperity Project, but I probably won't go anywhere near that. We'll see how we go. As my father used to say, I can't, can't wait to hear what I'm going to say next. So this will be sort of invented as I go along in a little bit. But I, and the only reason why is because I think uh, the PRIF, I've been involved with the Premier's uh, research initiatives for a long time. And I, and I think, in my view, this is one, if not the most successful one that I've seen. The whole idea around uh, the PRIF at that particular time was to rather than sort of uh, fund individual researchers was 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 the research cohort to come together, and a uh, and you know form a consortium that would, could do big things, right? And so this was a, 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 a I guess building on alliances that had been in place for quite some time between Uni uh, uh, the, the the Ian Walk Centre, and uh, and then people in, Peter and others in the in the Adelaide University. And so it was very successful, very targeted on, on the mission that you got in, in there in front of you. How do we, how do we make this, this industry that's really important for the state more efficient, uh, more cost effective, safer, uh, uh, more, uh, more able to handle uh, a, a, a decarbonised world, which is now driving everything we do. So everything the department does, our Department of Energy and Mining, is really all around the decarbonisation agenda. Uh, and how do we, and which is costly. So we've got, we've got high costs appearing because of uh, the changes that have to be made and yet we still want, want everything to be on the, the bottom end of the cost curve, otherwise it all moves somewhere else. So the State Prosperity Plan is sort of a, um, it, it sort of in some ways has come out of consortiums like this. New government coming in saying, all right, what's the, what is the economic story for South Australia? Um, well, it's been farming and mining for a long time, and it will be farming and mining for a t long time in the future. But the, this Premier is also keen on complexity, economic complexity. You know, and as, and as you all know, Australia rates very low on the, on the, on the overall economic complexity curve. So he was seeing, seeing the, 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 the opportunity to bring together uh, this decarbonisation agenda with the strengths that the state has got. And that's really what the state prosperity plan is all about. Politically, uh, it, it, in, in part, parts of it are, we're, we're investing about $600 million in a hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, power plant and uh, electrolyzer. That's, that will be the, you know, the biggest in the world when it gets built in 2025, 26, not that far away. Um, and already, uh, an industry, uh, an ecosystem is starting to develop around that to take hydrogen to de decarbonise. If you follow that line of logic further, what's the next cap off the rank? Well, the next cap off the rank is steel, one of the biggest emitters uh, you know, in the industrial sector. How do you get c coke ovens out of the mix? You, well, you do that by, uh, again, uh, direct reduction or through hydrogen, through a, an electric arc furnace producing green steel. So that's also part of the State Prosperity Project. Uh, and then the third element of that is copper. You know, we've got 70% of the, of, of the global 
uh, copper resources in South Australia. Um, how do we take advantage of that? And if you do some work, Ace Island did some work about what you know reasonable predictions look like, and you tot up a lot of money from GSP, a lot of which is essentially a lot of money from exports, and then a, a, a large FTE account, most of which are technical skills, the very thing you guys are now trained trained up to help you. We all know South Australia is a proud leader in renewable energy. Uh, currently, I think it's 74%. <coughs> Uh, is uh, renewable energy, but again, that's not without its problems, right? There's a huge amount of technical uh, gee wizardry that's had to go on to get to that point. Uh, early on, when we, when Mike Rann, and this is back in the Mike Rand day, started on this, he was, I think he had a target of 5% renewable, something like that. Uh, the, 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 the people, the experts were telling us at the time we could probably go to about 15, but then the grid would all fall apart. Well, here we are at 74, heading towards 100, and it hasn't fallen apart yet. But things, massive things, have had to change in the en energy system to to do that. Hydrogen Jobs Plan, as I mentioned, is a you know 600 million dollar um, investment by the government to to really create a market. Really, uh, it's not a market failure. It's actually it's a market maker. Um, we you know we uh, we've put an order for GE's first hydrogen powered uh, uh, power stations and uh, and they'll start breaking ground doing footings and things at the end of the year for that and uh, we're and we're still debating on how big the electrolyzer has got to be to go with it uh, some of it will fuel the, the power station some of it will go to uh, Wyala for their green still ambitions um, we've also looked and again it's a, this is an area for anybody in this room really even though you're <laughs> We're, we're sort of all, you know, all up. I guess I, I like to think of myself as a technical person, but as a bureaucrat for the last 20 years, I guess I can't really claim that anymore. But one of the things that we do do in South Australia and have done it well is, 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 is um, inventing or coming up with legislation which is sort of allows the groundwork for investment to go on. And that's what this one is all about. This is the Hydrogen Re Renewable Energy Act. And that takes six uh, pieces of legislation, brings them all into one, one minister, one department, and so uh, and, and we're setting it up because we've, we've got companies coming to South Australia who want to put gigawatts of uh, wind power, solar power uh, in outback South Australia. Uh, and so we didn't have the mechanism really to do that, now we have. All the other states are now trying to scrabble to do something similar. Uh, in, the, in their states because, you know, planning and uh, uh, regulation is a problem. Copper opportunity. Again, as part of the, this prosperity project, uh, as we all know, the world's going to need a hell of a lot more copper than it's got going at the moment. Hence, part of your, a key part of your work is going in, how do we, how do, we do more with less? You know, how do, how do we actually produce copper from lower grade ores? How do we actually reduce the costs of producing it? You know, Olympic Dam is a very high cost producer in, in global scales. It's, it's got to get way down the cost curve to be competitive with Chile, Peru, these sorts of places. So there's a, there's a kind of almost an existential problem for them. And your work uh, uh, is going to translate into that, into that area, for sure. I've no doubt about that. Uh, BHP have got ambitious plans for South Australia. Uh, they spent $10 billion on acquiring Oz Minerals. Um, so they, you know, I think their they, their target is their sort of public target is around 500,000 tons of copper metal by uh, t in the 2030s. Um, internally, they've got a, they've got a much higher ambition than that, and we want to help them. And your work that you've done will translate in there. So this is a, your picture from the you know what the PRIF consortium was attempting to do. And you've made serious progress in all of those, uh, all those areas. But also importantly, you've created a team here, a multicultural team of experts that really, you know, is a testament to, the, you know, to what individuals and teams can do. Uh, so I think, you know, people look back on this particular exercise and think, how the hell did they do that, and how did they pull it off? Um, we also, just getting back on the government, it's a bit of out of order here, but the, the government is also spending, is spending $300 million in a pre-feasibility study for a desal plant in Cape Hardy, 650 kilometre pipe up to OD, 
to pr provide fresh water for that entire length, basically. So it's partly to feed Olympic Dam and the expansions there and to get them off the, the Great Artesian <coughs> Basin, but also for hydrogen uh, plants, for other mines that are on that, on that chain to have access to water, which is, of course, you know, one of the, the critical bits for South Australia. And in time, the same, we'll, we'll, we'll turn our attention to the Braemar over near Broken Hill to, to solve the same problem. Um, as I say, part of the Prosperity Project is the Green Iron Opportunity. So we've, we had a, 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 a lecture series a few weeks ago, brought a whole bunch of people in to talk about it. Uh, we'll be doing a series of sort of deep dive exercises for the next month or two. And we're looking for expressions of interest. So again, we're asking people, kind of following the model that the PRIF did, was come back to government with consortium that makes sense, uh, tell us what you need from government, and give us, you know, give us a, 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 a commercial, practical path to achieve uh, the outcomes we want, which is essentially to make South Australia uh, one of the one of the points on the map that has a has a green iron and green steel industry. Uh, this, this is the way it's going. We've done the we've done the launch. We're doing forums now. Um, we will uh, seek submissions by October, and then we'll uh, develop a report to present back to to government by the end of the year. But really, what's happening is that already consortium are forming, already consortia are talking to government. So I think by the time we actually get to the report, things will be on the ground operating, and which is exactly what we're after. Uh, this is a map I use quite a bit. This is sort of a, you know, it's uh, the jewels and the crown in many ways. It's just a map of uh, the various commodities that we have. The, the bigger dots are uh, resources that are either being developed or will be developed. Uh, you've got a cluster in the green in the middle. That's really the, the, the copper province. You've got iron ore in Air Peninsula up north and over towards Braemar. We're the, we're the, you know, one of the world's be biggest uh, uranium exporters and the uranium prices have gone north just recently, so there's a huge amount of activity there. We've got some of the richest zircon deposits in the world over Jacinthe Ambrosia. And we've got an, an emerging critical minerals uh, cohort of uh, uh, parties that are working on graphite, rare earths and, uh, uh, and, and uh, high alumina um, uh, glass. Um, so we've got a, there's a lot going on, basically, is what that, that map is telling you. The pipeline green up the middle shows we'll, we'll sort of anything that's within 100 k's of that will benefit from that particular pipeline. Uh, and then the challenge is to bring in the more regional uh, aspects. So I don't need to tell you this, but uh, your, your, your very uh, excellent um, document here tells you that this stuff, I think of all the things that mattered to me, uh, was it, first of all, it was you know uh, Nigel and others bringing the team together in the first place. Had a bit of a shaky start, but getting the high quality researchers that you managed to get here, Nigel was a, a testament to you. Uh, the number of you know 140 odd papers, fantastic. Uh, the the the, the, the uh, role of women, you know, not that I think things have changed in the industry. I don't think it's a sort of barrier to entry anymore. But it's great to see the number of women and mining technology scholarships, um, any n a number of projects that are, are along the TR TRL scale, uh, and of course, you know, winning awards and the Premier's awards, that, and that's a very hotly contested uh, 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 series of awards there, so it was well deserved. So I guess in conclusion for me, personally, I think this has been the most successful uh, Premier's Research Fund uh, outfit that I've seen. I think uh, the, the, the results speak for themselves in terms of the productivity and the, and the skill that you've brought to the task. Uh, you've got a, a, a flotilla of companies that are engaged with you. Um, I guess it may well be, though, you might find, well, OK, what do we do now? And we just, we just start the back talking about what's next. Uh, and there are a number of opportunities now with the university merger the prosperity plan, how do we bring those two things together? How do we make sure the, the, the collaboration that you've established keeps on going? And, and then let's, have some, let's, let's, let's be ambitious again. What's the, next, what's the next big project we can tackle? But I, my experience will be that uh, the work that you've done uh, will probably take a bit of time to, to gestate in the companies. 
it takes it does take time for the good ideas to find, find you know wind their way through systems to actually appear on the on the mine site. So don't be discouraged by that. That's just the way it works. Um, um, but I think you've made a, a massive contribution to the state. I thank you all for that. I thank all all of you for your hard work. I know this stuff is, you know, days and nights of work. So I really appreciate that. And uh, and good luck for the future. Thank you. What are the types of programs that might be available in the near future to, to progress these sorts of things? Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would put it back at you saying, you know, we've done, we've done numbers of different sorts of projects over the years. I think the challenge is now the federal government's got a lot of money sitting there in national reconstruction funds and all sorts of stuff. But we as a state are finding it, and everybody is finding it really hard to unlock it, really hard. Uh, so what we're now doing is, uh, we've got, sorry, not the, this is the meeting on, I've got to go back to, but we've got, as a state, we're going to the Commonwealth saying, here's all our projects. We're spending $600 million on a hydrogen power plant. How about you spend the same amount and we double the size of it? That's what we're doing. Right? So I think there's an opportunity now with the university merger. One, make sure that the that, that, that resources and energy uh, complexity uh, value adding, value adding bit is really and really hard. So I know how hard it is, right? But you've got the government's attention right now that we, we, we know we've got the resources. And, um, there's a little bit of naivety, is that the right word? But this, it's like we've got the resources, got the energy, it should all just miracle, by a miracle happen, right? And we know that it doesn't quite go that way. So helping <coughs> us to frame, you know, what can you do given the resources we've got? Uh, and, and, and if it's a that centre of excellence, some of the training thing, uh, I would I would encourage you to get together and work out what, where does that fit in the university merger. So make sure this capability is, is enhanced, not lost. And there's always that risk, you know, engineering, expensive, you know, all that, we all know all that sort of stuff. But so what you do in this room is so pivotal to this premier, this particular premier's prosperity plan. You've got to remind him of that, and here and we've got to deal with you. Here it is. That's what I would be doing. And, 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 and it's a deal with an eye on what the feds are doing so that we can sort of say, all right, here's a bit of government money, here's the university's money and expertise. We can go to the feds through, you know, now we can go through conventional ways, but we know how slow and difficult that could be. Take advantage of the fact that we've, we've decided to take initiative to step go to them, saying, here's, here's our next uh, consolidated effort. And it's, it's working because all the other states are all scrambling in different departments are coming in through different doors. Um, so a, a coordinated effort is the way to go. Is there some way which what you just said could be fit, fitted into the merger or suggested to the merger? Well, absolutely could be. But uh, um, you need to tell me how to do that. I'm yeah. listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Everybody probably has my number, my mobile phone. I sit on the committees. I'm co-leading the Sustainable Green Transition Working Group, as I've mentioned before. People are welcome to reach out and um, provide their ideas. And I'm a fan of the group. No. And I think that, you know, identifying where the, you know, the gaps are. You know, we're just talking about you know, how hard it is to get a good idea in the commercial space. But oftentimes, you know, maybe that's just reality. It takes a long time for the good idea that somebody can pick it up, but maybe I think anything in that space where we can accelerate that transition uh, would be a good thing. I'm, I'm, I've always been a fan of the Swedish model of, of you know government university consortia that set up. You know, we're talking about so, uh, test plants, that kind of thing. I think that's something we should do as a state. We've done it in the past. And that's the other thing we've done. A lot of the stuff we've done before, Andor was a government laboratory, right? And then eventually sold off. But, it, but, it, but it's Norton Jackson who set it up. Uh, he said, well, look, yeah, what we have to do is we have to make money out of the things we've got in this state. 
So how do you make money out of crappy midnight coal? How do you make money out of... And so a lot of things we're doing now would have started back in the Northern Jackson era, you know, because, you know, how do you, how do you turn nothing into something? The classic entrepreneur dilemma. And also, don't forget legislative change. So I keep now talking about um, policy entrepreneurship, right? We've done, we set up the uh, trolling and geothermal act before there was any geothermal. And so for a period of time, we had about 100% of all the geothermal investment in South Australia. We've now done the same thing with carbon capture and storage. We've got the legislative tools in place to do it, safety and everything like that all done. So if people can do that here, they can't do it in any other state easily, right? They have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. HRE Act, same thing. The industry's not here yet, uh, and we, yeah, we've got legislation in place for it. So that's something that this government can do as well. You know? So it's not just a sort of thing sort of outside your your ends of you know, university giving up resources. Think about a, a broader state. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, you're the premier. What do I want? I want, I want jobs and opportunity. I want complexity. I want to make, make the most of what we've got. Come up with a, come up with a way of delivering that. That brings us to the end. Thanks very much. This is something in there that tells you that does rather well. Thanks for coming for today. We really appreciate your time. So our next speaker is uh, is one of our our researchers. It's Dr. Kirsten Liu. Uh, who completed a doctoral degree through the PRIF in applied mathematics, and that was conferred in October last year. Her PhD studied a novel ferric iron sensor using mathematics to understand the macroscopic and microscopic behavior between ferric ions and the sensor. And she's now a research assistant under the supervision of Richmond and Jigsui, and is currently working on machine learning interpretability methods applied to the machine models trained on data from Olympic Dam. So Kirsten, who has come into State Forest today, we're very lucky to have her, has enjoyed working with people outside of her field on something with direct applications. She found being exposed to other fields besides mathematics amazing. She's loved witnessing the progress of a device that has been developed from scratch with something that's now being prepared for commercialization. And she now has a greater insight behind how minds work with a greater appreciation for the industry and the various components and types of people that are needed to run mines. Kirsten's greatest achievement has been convincing non-believers that mathematics has its place everywhere and is very useful, even though it's a theoretical field. And she's certainly been, I think, one of the people you've convinced very well. And she also has loved making great connections through the PRIF. So welcome, uh, Dr. Kirsten Liu. Hello everyone. Today I'll be presenting work that Van and I have done and it's an extension of the Perf Translation Project 9 where there has been a lot of work done regarding predictive models and it showed how important chemistry data is. So our project still remains, the extension project still remains in the flotation circuit and we use predictive models and an optimization algorithm to improve copper recovery while using pulp chemistry data. And we get our pulp chemistry data from the Megapulp, which Chris has described quite lovely to us this morning. And if we take a closer look at where our project lies, here we have a plant, and there are many sensors in the plant that report the state of the flotation circuit. And importantly, we have the pulp chemistry data. And one of our objectives was to collect uh, chemistry data. We've got chemistry data from BHP and from a second location. So Van and I process this data where I have done model validation and also applied interpretation methods to understand the models. Van has developed an optimization algorithm to restore poor performing recovery levels to a targeted um, good performing level. So these recommendations are then given to a plant operator. So we have a metallurgist that then interprets these recommendations and makes 
changes accordingly. As of last year, as the end of last year, our project was at a TRL 7, where we proved concept and we have proved concept and had a prototype demonstrated on site. Now our project sits at the TRL 8, where we have the Megapulp on multiple sites, and we have a commercially relevant system, and we've tested research here. So what we have found is that the predicted models work, and they still work well with the new data. And when we apply interpretation methods to them, we can identify key performing features that help understand what drives copper recovery. Then we have our optimization method where we can increase or we can suggest changes in, in the conditions in the plant to restore levels, copper recovery levels above the threshold. And especially here, we can see instantly a time savings. So this is beneficial to us because what we currently face is that there is an increasing demand for copper as technology is becoming more integrated into society. However, we have a projected decreasing in all, all grade. So these conflicting trends um, puts a bit of pressure. So our findings help alleviate that pressure where we save time and we improve copper recovery. Um, and also, we reduced material waste. If we go back to uh, Translation Project 9, this started off with model building. And our first step was collecting data from the plant and from Megapulp so we can get chemistry data. And this data is processed and cleaned and then, um, and then we're able to split the data then we study it further and we have a selective features and we can see which features help with model, uh, which features contribute most to model prediction. And the novelty here was the inclusion of pulp chemistry data. Then several models were built and then later tested. And we found that the Gaussian predictive model was the best performing model. So what I did was validate these models, and all of the previously tested models still work. Um, however, the documentation just needed to be a little bit more detailed in terms of data processing. Um, but again, the models um, from the previously reported models to what I've tested give similar results, and the Gaussian model is still the best performing model. So the sticking point around machine learning is its black box nature, because we don't really know what's happening in here. And I can understand the reluctance to just base business decisions on these results, because are these results safe? Is this model reliable enough? Do, does this model capture enough changes in the environment, can we trust these results? So at the heart of it, we're asking why. Why does this model give us certain predictions? And this is where interpretability methods come in. They help explain the why. So here we have a trained model, and when we want to apply a local interpretation method to it, we select a single observation, run it through the model, and we get a <coughs> prediction. And we can apply a local interpretability method to understand this single prediction and how the features affect the prediction. And if we wanted a broader understanding of the model and how the features affect prediction, we need several observation points and get their corresponding local explanation, and then we can form a global understanding. And in this case, the model is suggesting there's a change in, more, in all mineralogy. So I will show you some examples of a local explanation and a global explanation. So I use the Gaussian machine learning model, and here we have three observations, and here is their standardized predicted copper recovery. 
So I use the local method calculating Shapley meth values. These are the Shapley values. And what they do is help us understand the contribution of each feature to a prediction. So if we had to look at X5, this is frothing tank 4. This has a contribution of about 0.3 to the prediction of copper recovery. Um, but if we wanted to have a global understanding, three observations aren't enough. Likewise, if we wanted to look at redox potential, three observations aren't enough. So what we can do is plot the feature importance. So this is the absolute value of the Shapley values and averaged across the feature, across the data. So when we have large absolute Shapley values, that means that that feature has the greatest importance. And this is in descending order of importance. For the purposes of our study, chemistry data has been quite significant. So if I had to concentrate on the redox potential and I wanted to understand how the redox potential affects copper recovery, this is quite simple. I can plot a global interpretation using the Shap dependence plot, where for each observation we plot their redox potential on the x-axis with their corresponding Shapley value on the y-axis. And here we can see an increasing trend. So as redox potential increases, the predicted copper recovery increases. Um, and an alternative plot to this is the partial dependence plot. All in all, we want to minimize variance and work towards the goal of low cost and high metal recovery. And the quicker we can make decisions to return a poor recovery rate to a set threshold, to above a set threshold, the more stable our environment becomes. So in the present moment, if we know conditions will result in a poor recovery, we can optimally change conditions to have a recovery rate, a predicted recovery rate above the set threshold. So Van's research question is how do we do this quickly and accurately? And her answer is by using a predictive model and an optimization technique. So here we have our threshold for copper recovery. Above the line is good performance, below the line is poor performance. Here we have historical data. And so conventional optimization methods can predict or can set our poor performing recovery rate above the threshold so we can have a targeted good performing rate. But this isn't always the case for all performing poor recovery um, rates. So the new, con new um, optimization algorithm looks at historical data including pulp chemistry and uses clustering techniques, then uses a predictive model to ensure that our poor performing recovery rate has a target value above the threshold. So, and the key differences here between the new and the old optimization method is that the new optimization method uses a predictive model, and it also has a time savings. So Van is currently reporting a minimum of 20 minutes when compared to the conventional searching algorithm. And that is all today from me. I would like to thank my team, Chris, BHP, um, PRIF members, and the South Australian government. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, great piece of work. And uh, now we'll open for questions. And we from Makoto. Um, I don't have a question, but just a remark. Uh, thank you for showing those data and results you found. 
because okay. now I'm much, much more confident with the findings I have as well, uh-huh. um, especially with the Gaussian algorithm, which is the best I found. Mm-hmm. It's not the best learner. Um, well, it is the best learner, but it's not the best fit, but it gives you the best prediction as well. Mm. Um, so I just want to thank you for those. And with a black box thing, people think it's a black box, but in reality it's based on pure mathematics, as you have said in, in the introduction. And you can explain that, but you need to go a lot more deeper in those transforms or Fourier transforms to explain that, which takes a long, a lot more time. But in fact, it's not black box. But from our human brains, it seems to be a black box to us, but it's explained by the maths. Thank you. Thank you. So this specific local method is model agnostic. So if you had to change your um, base model, the um, method stays the same, and how you interpret it also stays the same. So it's fairly easy to change between models. I'm, I'm Tian Fu Lu from University of Adelaide. In terms of your machine learning, I wonder do you use um, supervised learning or you use, or have you ever tried to use such as reinforced learning so it can online continuous learn and adjust itself to the changes? Um, I haven't investigated that, so I first um, validated the work that has already been done and then applied these methods. So that is a great continuation of the project. Yes. So the answer is no, I haven't tested that. So I don't know um, how that will change um, interpretations. Um, so yes, but, it, but as the model changes, you will see changes in interpretations, but it's not going to be significant enough to um, say that, oh, um, it, the initial interpretations were incorrect, if that makes sense. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Kirsten, Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. is the project of uh, Piotr Pavlishak. Now, unfortunately, Piotr is not able to be with us today. He's got the, uh, the dreaded thing that's going around. I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Piotr, um, tell you about him. He's a postdoctoral researcher working at the Future Industries Institute at UniSA. He completed his PhD in Minerals and Resources at UniSA in 2021, and currently is a postdoctoral uh, researcher in the mining consortium to develop and validate the use of metal organic frameworks as a sensing device for ferric iron detection. His greatest achievements during the PRIF have been successful validation of the moth synthesis method and improving the moth composite sensor fabrication process. He has also confirmed the feasibility of moth sensing capabilities. And this is a project that quite possibly could go well, uh, well beyond the mining sector. Now, one uh, member of the group, this is Anton here, uh, has agreed uh, to, to give uh, Piotr's talk. And just to introduce Anton uh, briefly, Anton is a group leader at UniSA, uh, Clinical and Health Sciences, and has been part of the PRIF team developing uh, the sense of a detection of, of ferric ions. So he's been very much involved in the research. His background is in uh, polymer chemistry, with a focus on applied technologies to address challenges across the environmental <laughs> sustainability and ecological sectors. Uh, when he's not uh, researching, he enjoys playing, uh, uh, playing strategy board games, building Lego models, um, and spending time in nature. And I'm also informed 
but Anton is an amazing dude who, like Bill, uh, appreciates the true glory of chilies. <laughs> Quote, unquote. All right, over to you, Anton, to, to present the, uh, the presentation. Thank you, Nigel, for that kind introduction. Um, so as Nigel mentioned, I'm part of the team that have helped develop this sensor, and I'm stepping in for Piotr today. Um, Piotr prepared this presentation, so I have looked at it, but I'll try and stumble through it as best as I can, and hopefully do it justice. Okay, how do I go forwards? Oh, is that forwards? Okay. So the aim of this project was to develop a optical sensor to sense ferric ions, selectively sense ferric ions in a complex mixture. So this might be in, uh, oops, backwards, might be for uh, leaching or flotation cells where the, the concentration of ferric ions is important for improving recovery. So we wanted to develop an optical sensor that could detect the ferric ions in the, in the presence of all these other ions and uh, variable pH as well. So we had a number of uh, criteria, design criteria for this particular sensor, and we base the sensor around what's known as a metal organic framework, or a MOF. So these are uh, metals embedded within an um, organic <coughs> continuous network, and the metal sensors respond to their interaction with other metals and give out a um, distinctive, um, in this case, luminescence response. So there's, oops, wrong button again. So there's a number of advantages of using these sort of sensors. They can potentially give you very good accuracy, so detection at very low concentrations as well. And if they're built into things like a, um, optic, a fiber optic, then you can just use them by dipping them into solution. They give you a very fast response. Uh, they can be engineered to be selective. Um, they can have quite a dynamic sensing range as well, as we'll see. Um, and they can be quite robust. So these types, or detecting ferric ions, is not just important for mining applications, but it has a whole wide range of applications. As Nigel suggested, these sort of um, optical sensing technologies can be used in different applications. So, for instance, in the biomedical field, they can be used for sensing ferric ions that are important for various different uh, conditions and diseases. In um, the environmental sector, they can be they're important to know the iron concentration for looking at things like microbial growth, as well as for the quality of drinking water. So, lots of potential applications of these technologies. So in the leaching process, and I suppose as well this extends to flotation, I think Piot has focused here, Piot has focused here on the leaching because the project was originally looking at the, the leaching, um, but these sort of optical sensors for ferric eyes can also be used in the flotation cells. Um, but we need to be able to detect the ferric ions in the presence of all these other types of metal ions that might be present. So the sensors need to be highly selective to ferric ions. So I'll go through how we made the sensor, um, how it was integrated into the fiber optic, and uh, what the next steps are. So this work was originally started by Linda Rosenberger, who was a PhD student in the PRIF. Um, and she had taken the project all the way through to putting the MOF, so the actual sensing component, into the fibre optic. And then this, the work that Piotr has done has been to continue that, to reproduce it, and to take it through as a PRIF extension project to actually, a, hopefully, a commercial device. And he's working on that now. So we make these MOFs simply by taking a oops, back by taking a europium nitrate, so a lanthanide, mixing that with an organic um, ligand, so 2-methoxyterephthalic acid, 
And basically cooking that up together and it forms a continuous three-dimensional network with the europium ions embedded within that network. And this is the crystal structure of the moth and there's a picture of it there so you can see it's a bright orange colour. So we know it's this structure because we can analyse the XRD and predict the structure, the network structure and match that to the experimental results. And you can see they match quite nicely. Um, so we can actually determine what the structure of the moth is and how the europium ions are arranged within that three-dimensional continuous network. So having the moth on its own isn't really much use, it's just a powder. If you want to incorporate that into a working sensor, then we need to embed the moth into some sort of matrix that's going to hold the moth and prevent it from just dissolving away um, or getting degraded in a complex solution. So the next step in the process is to incorporate the MOF, and that's a sensing component, remember, inside a polymer matrix. So the polymer matrix helps to disperse the MOF, provides a large surface area for the MOF to interact with ions in solution, and prevents degradation of the MOF. So this is done by taking a solution of the MOF in a monomer and then polymerizing the monomer around the MOF to embed the MOF within a polymer matrix. So it's a relatively simple process. We take the monomer MOF solution or suspension. We then put that into a 3D printed mold. There's a photo um, curing agent there, so it cures the, the monomers and we form this composite. So you end up with these relatively transparent composites with the MOF embedded within the polymer matrix. So these can be then used initially to assess whether or not or how the composite responds to different iron, ferric iron concentrations. So Piotr, Piotr made um, various different compositions, so slightly different formulations and assessed how they performed. So there's four different, I think he did more than this in actual fact, but there's four here. Um, the first one where he had a coarse moth, so that means the moth isn't ground, the particles are quite large. Um, a, one where he finely grinds the moth, and it actually changes colour. So it starts off as orange, and as you grind it more and more, it becomes a pale yellow, um, related to the size of the particles. Composite C was the same base polymer formulation, but more heavily crosslinked, so a more rigid polymer network. Um, and then... So composite D was again a more rigid polymer network um, with additional cross-linker to really make it hard and tough. So the response of these composites was studied using fluorimetry and the europium in the moth will um, have a luminescence response when it's excited. So excitation of the MOF or the composite at 320 nanometers results in emissions at around about 600. So you can see these emissions from the different um, composites when they're excited at 320 nanometers. And depending on the composite, how it's made, how the MOF is embedded into the polymer network, you get a different response when the MOF is excited. Now the reason for making these different composites was because Ultimately, the composite is going to be incorporated onto the end of a fibre optic. So it needs to be able to bond to the fibre optic. Um, and we want it to have a strong response to the ferric ions, but at the same time not detach from the fibre optic. So there's a balance here between having a composite that doesn't swell, so it's a rigid network, but more rigid networks have a poorer response to ferric ions or to ions in solution. So there was a balancing act between getting it rigid enough that it wouldn't detach from the fibre optic, but still be responsive, strong or highly responsive and sensitive to ferric ions. And that's why these different composites were made. And these last two, C and D, were the ones that swelled the least. So those, those were the ones that were taken forward. And C in, in particular um, was one of the ones that swelled the least, but also had a very strong response. 
So formulation or composite C was selected moving forward. So how does it respond to iron? Well, its response to ferric ions is beautiful. You get this very nice linear response to different iron, ferric ion concentrations. So in the presence of um, the iron, when the composite is illuminated or excited at 320 nanometers, then you can see that as we increase the iron, the emission from the moth actually decreases. So you get this beautiful linear relationship between the iron concentration and the change in intensity of the emission. So this is just the original starting intensity with, in the absence of the iron divided by the intensity in the presence of the iron. So it relates to the decrease. So increased ferric iron concentration, uh, you can see this linear response. And we want, obviously, the MOF to be reversible, this process, so we can easily reuse the sensor or reuse the composite. And this cycles around between water or putting the MOF composite into water and then into an iron, ferric iron solution and repeating that process and going back and forth. And you can see that the rep response is very reproducible. So we can do this over multiple cycles without any significant loss or change in the response of the composite. Now, is it selective? Obviously, if we want to just detect ferric ions, we want to make sure that it doesn't, the composite doesn't respond to any other ions that might be in the solution. And this particular composite is a, um, for, ferric, for ferric ions, so here, shows a reduction in the intensity of the emission. But you can see in the absence, sorry, in the presence of all these other ions, so different ions from alkali metals here up to transition metals, and copper as well, very important, that we see very little change in the emission signal from the uh, composite. So this is very good. It's very um, sensitive to ferric ions, very insensitive to these other ions. So it's quite selective. And then finally, we tested the composite in a complex mixture consisting of ions that might be present in a leaching solution and at a low pH. So there's copper, aluminium, ferric and ferrous ions here, as well as pH three. And in this complex mixture, we get a reduction in the intensity of the emission from the moth. And that, is that gonna work? And if you calculate the concentration of the ferric ions in this mixture, based on that reduction in emission, you get a value of about 45 ppm. And that's extremely close to the original value in solution. So even in this complex mixture, the composite is very, can very accurately detect or determine the concentration of iron, ferric ions in solution. So the final step, now that we've got a robust, sensitive and selective composite, is to integrate that onto the end of a fiber optic. So we imagine a simple portable device like this, where you have a mini um, laser and spectrometer all built into a little device that can hook up to your laptop. And then to, into that, you can connect the fiber optic and you can embed the composite on the end of the fiber optic. So you can just simply dip it into the solution that you want to determine the ferric iron concentration from. Um, so this is where Piotr is up to. He's polymerizing the composite onto the end of this fiber optic. Um, and this just involves dipping the fiber optic into a solution of the monomer and the moth, and then using laser, firing a laser light down the actual fiber optic to polymerize the composite onto the end of the fiber optic. He hasn't yet got to testing that. He's still optimizing this process um, to get a nice, thin, and consistent film on the end of the fiber optic. All right, so that brings me to the end. Obviously, I'd like to thank everybody involved in the project and Piotr for putting this presentation together, and hopefully I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, the mic, mic one has just fallen asleep. Oh, oh, yeah. 
Thanks, Fraser. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, have you done some lifespan studies to work out how long they could last in, say, a complex, you know, reagent mixture at different pHs and all yeah. aggressive chemistries and so on and so forth? So we haven't done it in a complex mixture. We've done some studies looking at the effect of pH and stability to extremes. Um, and the moth will start, to, even in the composite, will start to decompose once you get around about pH 1, 1 1.5. Um, by having the moth embedded in the composite, it does improve the stability, but we haven't done that real complex mixture yet where you've got other ions there as well. And presumably if fabrication costs are, are fairly low, you could have a regular replacement regime going anyway. Yes, so these, if I'll just back up a second, these sort of devices uh, you can buy for about a thousand bucks. And um, so the tips, so I've got a couple of these in my lab for detection of oxygen, and if the tip gets damaged, you send it back to the supplier, they coat it again for a couple of hundred bucks. So it's pretty cheap to get sort of these sort of devices um, uh, refreshed and to get new coatings on there. But obviously you want the coating to be as robust as possible and last as long as possible. Those, those are tests that we haven't done yet, not on a fibre optic anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a related question. Could you speculate at all on the potential for fouling due to organic additives that might be in the solution, like yep. collating agents? Yeah, again, tests that we haven't done. Um, this, this particular mixture, as far as I'm aware, and it, the work has been published, I think it was just that combination of ions and a pH. There wasn't any additives or organic substances in there. So we have no idea how that would foul the, sub, the actual composite. But I would imagine that there is going to be some interaction there because the composite is a hydrophobic polymer, reasonably hydrophobic. So you'd expect there to be some sort of fouling. Whether or not that has a significant influence on the sensitivity, we just we don't know. We haven't done those tests yet. But that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Yeah. The last question. Anybody else? So that brings us to the next uh, item on the, on the agenda, our, our panel discussion. And uh, what we're going to do is um, invite a few people you've already seen um, and a couple of others up to take these, uh, these comfy chairs at the, at the front here uh, and have a panel discussion. So you've already met uh, Professor Michael Goodsight from the University of Adelaide, our first panelist. Our second panelist is Chris Greet uh, from Magato. It's also spoken earlier. And the next one is Ben Koch. Uh, now, Ben is a graduate of the University of Adelaide whose career has been dedicated to advancing automation technologies and improving efficiencies across mining and agricultural sectors. He has been involved in numerous mining projects across the globe and over the last 20 years, and now heads up the bulk handling solutions team at Eka Software Solutions and has been very much involved in one of our prep projects, which you'll hear about this afternoon. So our last member of the panel is Simon Ratcliffe. Now Simon is an experienced company executive, team builder, software engineer, and product development entrepreneur. And during a long career in the private sector, he's been instrumental in the design, development, and commercialization of several leading software and hardware products that continue to enjoy success in the highly competitive global mining technology industry. He continues in industry practice today as Head of Experimentation and Technology at MapTech, 
MapTech, as well as holding a professorship at the University of Adelaide in software engineering, which has just commenced um, and uh, is teaching undergraduates at the University of Adelaide and enjoying it, I think you said, at the break time. Um, okay, Simon has always been drawn to the interaction of ideas and technology with industry challenges and commercial opportunities. In his spare time, he is notoriously low-tech. It's spent running, windsurfing, fishing, and camping. And I believe you're going up to the Flinders Ranges this coming weekend. All right, that's our team. Our theme for the, um, for the panel discussion is strengthening research collaboration between academia and industry to help drive advancements in the mineral sector. It's quite a sort of far-reaching topic, and I hope we're going to have some interesting discussion in the next half hour. So I'm just going to sit down over here. And I'm going to start off by, first of all, asking each of you in turn, and maybe we do that uh, from, I was going to say from right to left, probably from left to right, the way the audience are looking at you, uh, what you feel could be done to strengthen collaboration what do the universities do well? And what could we perhaps do better? And what would be needed to actually make that uh, to be better actually happen? So maybe we'll start off with Mike. Wow. Um, so to strengthen collaboration, I think we have to all realize we're here for the long game and um, commit to longer term efforts and uh, understanding each other's risk and temporal profiles. That's, I think that's something that we're not very good at understanding. We know we have different risk appetites and different temporal um, needs, uh, but, but it's very, it, we, have, we have them for good reasons and for other reasons. What we do well, I think, is um, listen to to meet, to, to need and respond to it. I think we can do that better. And I think we need, the opportunity is to understand where there is real market pull and not send ideas that we push into the market that are solutions looking for problems, but to have this interactive dialogue so that as we plan our research and educational efforts, um, we're, we're sending solutions to the market that we know there's already a need. So, thank you. Good question. Um, universities do good research if they're directed to what the industry wants. Your biggest problem, as far as I'm concerned, is finding the right people within the industry. Um, with I, When I did my PhD at with um, Ian Walk, what was even before Ian Walk, um, through Amira, there were oh, probably about 25 or 30 companies in that project. Most of those companies don't exist now. They've all been swallowed up by bigger monster companies um, who at a probably at a very senior level, probably don't understand the problems they have on mine sites. Um, in preparing the CRCP application, I went to a number of mining companies to see if they could give me some indication if they'd give me cash or in-kind. I could get people at a reasonably high middle level to commit to that, but they then had to speak to somebody higher who were more budget conscious and probably said no in some instances. So it's, it's cultivating a relationship vertically within an organisation to be able to get money to do the research. The people at a lower level probably understand the problems. <coughs> they will appreciate the solutions you bring, but the ones above who control the purse strings probably have no idea what you're talking about. Thank you, Chris. Uh, ben. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I, I think uh, building on what Michael said, um, 
I've been involved with various university projects for probably almost tw uh, 20 years now. Um, so I think the, the long-term uh, relationships are important. Um, at the same time, I think this, it's important to uh, recognise different um, needs that a, a METS company, from my perspective, might have. Um, so um, we, we've, uh, we've worked before on PhD projects, and so you might be looking at three or four years without great certainty of whether there'll be a commercial outcome. Um, and we're happy to do that, and that, that's, that's good uh, in, in some cases, but there's other needs where I think um, programs where you could have a, a six-month intensive um, uh, research application to, to, to help build an algorithm um, or, or to work with a, uh, a more advanced researcher um, because often in the, in the commercial space um, we're working with tight timelines or, or, or trying to get a quick commercial edge. So I think um, the longer relationship, but also sometimes the more uncertain and, and uh, uh, longer term projects are, can be a bit daunting um, you know, for getting funding approvals and so on, uh, or, or, or sponsorship approvals. Thanks, Ben. So I think something that universities do really well is they have the the grant application, the brand power, and the collaboration machinery to build these quite large-scale collaborative enterprises that far exceeds any capability that I see in the in the private sector, and um, that that's a real strength, and it includes their ability to work with with government as well uh, on putting together large and um, ambitious programs. One thing that um, I struggle with when it comes to the research in universities and the research agenda, and this is informed by computer science and software engineering as much as mining engineering, is the, you know, the pressure to publish drives everyone towards novelty. And the easiest way to find novelty is to go out on the fringes of knowledge. And it tends to be in areas that are not necessarily relevant, right? Or, or right, at, right where the, the heart of problems are. There's a lot of bits and pieces that are left behind as the research pushes out to those frontiers. And in those gaps is where private industry have their problems and have their, <clears throat> their potential for, for really making a difference. And I, I would love research to be somehow restructured in a way that those gaps become the appealing places to have the talent coming in and, of course, working very closely and collaboratively with industry to solve the, the real genuine problems that live in those gaps. Because often a private company's agenda is to ignore the gaps for as long as possible to get a product to market to start making money with it and um, live, live with the, the knowledge gaps and the ability to implement things well in those gaps. Thank you, Simon. And I think that was an incredibly important point. I'm not sure if there's anybody in the audience who, who might want to sort of follow up on that, whether Bill or, or Peter or somebody else in the university environment, on this, on this tremendous push now towards publication, uh, which often, as you say, takes us to the fringes of knowledge, all very exciting, but doesn't always answer the problems. It's a real issue. And I think also, Ben, you picked up on you know, the, the time it can take to do a PhD. And there's not even a guarantee that the student is going to finish in three or four years. Um, I have certainly, from personal experience, can say it's very, very difficult to pitch PhD projects, even if they're half financed by the university to industry, to, especially to the minerals industry. Um, they want something in a year, a year or two. Um, but something of the sort of you know, depth of a PhD rather than just a master's student. So it's very difficult. <coughs> So just on those comments, and for those who might not be aware of some of the plans for Adelaide University, when we come together, some of the actions being taken to um, help um, bridge some of the gaps mentioned are one, students will have work integrated learning. And, um, and uh, that's, that's, I think, is super exciting. 
Um, two, we have the signature research themes that are not only about research excellence, but they're also about research impact and relevance. Um, and that requires a lot of thought um, and probably a lot of dialogue because if professors are left to um, just decide what that means, chances are we'll still be going to the fringe because that's where we see incentive. Um, and three, we're, we're starting a new um, MRES program that's a, a, an internationally recognized masters of research that can replace an honors program, one and a half years, and that's to be able to give basic um, research um, competency in a faster means than a PhD and also modular. So if there's a case after that one and a half year to then continue on to a full PhD, you may, but otherwise you get an internationally recognized um, uh, 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 degree by exiting after one and a half years. Now, um, it'll be interesting because I haven't really seen it tried in Australia before and it will really require dialogue with industry to dial that in to ensure that the graduates are actually um, exactly what industry is looking for. Because at the end of the day, that's why students study, is to be able to go out to industry, most of them, very few of them, um, to stay in the academic system. And we have to be able to be good at preparing them for both. Uh, I would love to see mechanisms in the university where there are staff positions whose job it is to actively stay in touch with the local industry and local ecosystem. And it's, 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 it's more done on an informal basis these days where, you know, a lot of professors keep in touch with their grad students and that, that is a great mechanism. But I also think there could be this more active discovery process as well for the universities, just really, really, you know, understanding the local ecosystem and shopping around for relevant problems that are causing the, the, the local industry to face headwinds and difficulties. I think that's important. I think, you know, also state government has a role there as well in that they're in touch. Um, I, I guess a, a bit of an issue is it's just the constant changing faces of, of people that you, you're dealing with. Now, you know, we, we know you three very well throughout the PRIF, and that's been fantastic that we've been talking to the same people at MAPTEC, the same people at ECHO, the same people at MAGATO for the last seven years, but that's not necessarily the rule for an awful lot of the other um, organisations we've been working with uh, and can be, I think, really problematic. Um, as you say, I think once you build up a certain momentum and you're actually dealing with your... Uh, graduate students who have now gone out to industry, that really is a, is a huge big plus uh, to be able to do that. And, you know, lucky that there's at least a few organizations where, where we can do that. Now, in case anybody's wondering, um, we're four men sitting up here at, at the front. We did ask uh, Janine Herzig to, to join us today. You remember perhaps Janine from last year. And um, she uh, sent me an email here, which I'm going to read out briefly. Um, greetings from County Mayo in Ireland, which is on holiday. Sorry I can't be there in person. A year ago when I participated in a similar PRIF panel session, I spoke about the frustrations of dealing with IP and how it was stifling innovation. In particular in the context of Seek International's Global Water Initiative, an interdisciplinary collaboration between resource companies, vendors, service providers, regulators, consultants and academia. Unfortunately, one year later, and many collaborative workshops by passionate volunteers to develop a roadmap, agreeing on the urgency and importance of the research and having the funds to do so, the researchers have not undertaken any work. SIG's objective is to make the findings of the research available to all in open source. Discussions with our industry partners, company sponsors, and vendors have been straightforward in terms of handling resulting IP, but universities, and this is a lot of universities, um, are another story. And Janine asks, perhaps the panelists, and perhaps we start again with Michael, uh, could speak to how we might streamline these types of IP discussions so that we, one can actually get to work quicker than we do at the moment. Thanks, and, and look, that's, those are comments that universities hear around the world. And I'll probably really oversimplify now, so forgive me by doing this. But in industry, if you're conducting research and development in your lab in-house and you have a re eureka moment that has a finding, one, you can say you do not disclose that to anybody, and two, you can say it is our property, we own it. In a university, 
when we are dealing with students who are paying us to have their education, they automatically have an interest. And so whenever we're conducting collaboration and there's a eureka moment, we have to go back and actually speak to and do diligence to ensure that that IP is still protected. And oftentimes, whether it happens from students or staff, we find out that it's actually already been disclosed because we get to those drivers about publications again. And that's well within their rights. So the, the, the situation for us is not as straightforward as industry. And I think one of the solutions is, as we sign students up to certain collaborative projects or as we conduct collaborative projects, you ensure that there's an understanding of it of IP up front. But it's got to be um, in everyone's interests. And again, oversimplifying, if somebody comes to me and says, we're industry, we help pay for that, we want all the IP. One, I'm not in a position to promise that because the students have rights. But two, those aren't helpful to a partnership. That's, that's not meeting in the middle. So we have to be able to talk about how do we partner around people's rights. And partners have to understand that other partners cannot waive other people's interests and rights. And that's, that's sometimes, um, sometimes frustrating, I, I, I know, but that's our reality. And because a student has a university email doesn't mean that we have policies that can just tell them you have to you have to assign IP. They might choose to publish. And um, they're, they're an investor in the university. So it creates situations that we just have to talk through, and that takes time. But I hear it all the time, and I'm all ears to hear ways to improve it. Thanks. I've got nothing to say about IP. It just confuses things. I'm still waiting for my one euro for the patent on Mago Pulps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll confirm that when, when I, um, you know, with senior management in, in, in my company, um, uh, you know, trying to get a, a, some sort of sponsorship or co collaboration partnership off the ground, that is, IP is always a concern. So, um, uh, you know, certain people in the legal areas, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Michael, um, and obviously it's a very important thing for the university prote to protect. Um, I think there's a difference, and, and, and some of the discussions that have uh, gone a bit south that I've been involved with, um, there's a difference between, uh, potentially, to think about a, a genuine novel discovery that happened during the course of a project, and where the company has um, maybe came in and, and, and framed in, in a lot of detail what the project's going to be and, 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 and what the research is. And I have found sometimes, you know, uh, I guess from a slightly external pers uh, perspective, but sometimes the, um, the university is geared up for that, that big discovery IP. We're talking about just going through a um, you know, a, a predefined set of research goals that we've set um, and, and we're not really talking about the same thing. So I think there's probably a horses for courses, maybe some agreement up front uh, about a share, uh, a, a, a equitable share, acknowledging both parties' inputs. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess that, that's what I had to say. The biggest problem I see with IP is it's the machinery around it is such a wasteful process because in reality only 1% of projects reach an outcome where IP issues are actually important. And so for 99% of projects you put the surrounding IP framework in place through a lot of negotiation and backwards and forwards and time wasting and it turns out in the fullness of time, there was no relevance to having that in place. So you see it's a very inefficient process. Um, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that for the 1%, if pre-existing agreements aren't in place, 
this can then lead to inequitable distribution of profits, royalties, money or whatever if, if the idea takes off. So it's, it's a problem that doesn't have a, a, a terribly obvious solution. Um, MapTech's taken the view with several of its more recent projects where we, we just try and downplay the IP issue. We, we, we have unencumbered IP agreements with all the parties involved and the parties can, um, you know, run with it and do with the IP what they want. And our stance there is that, particularly in software and, and you know, high tech, I think IP is actually becoming less and less important because the pace at which new things go out to market is such that these IP mechanisms are almost irrelevant. It's about who's the, who's the first mover, who's the early adopter, and, um, you know, as long as there's not barriers to people moving with new ideas, um, the IP issue is maybe fading over time. But that's, that's really the only positive ray I have on the, on the whole IP debate, yeah. Well, well, th thank you all. Oops. Well, thank you all. Is there anybody in the audience that would, wants to uh, make a comment or ask a question around these issues? Perhaps. Hi. Hi, Clint. Um, I think just a comment probably, I mean, there's two things about IP. IP is about managing risk for big mining companies and I think that's very different in um, the space that, that, that we're dealing in with, with the PRIF consortium. I mean, um, big mining companies, the ones I used to work for, um, they don't want to be locked out of their own deposits. And I think that's one of the issues that um, mining has with IP, but it, on the other side of the foot, I've also been in the METS space, and for them, you know, IP is part of their, their business. So I think you, you've got conflicting issues in terms of IP where people have to understand, you know, each of the different stakeholders have different issues with IP and how how to manage those 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 in, those um, interactions? So I think just maybe just to think about that. Thank you. <clears throat> I guess moving on. Um, I guess something else, and it's sort of a related topic, if you like, is sort of research funding models, um, and what do you consider the, the potential roles of both federal and state government in projects like the PRIF, getting academia and universities working together. Uh, and I guess the big question, do the existing programs really meet the needs of industry? And I'm thinking research councils, CRCs, CRCPs and so on. Who would like to go first on that one? Funding's a big problem, isn't it? I mean, industry wants the government to fork out all the dollars Government would like to put in some dollars, but have industry commit more dollars. Um, industry, or well, the, the big miners would like METS companies to spend money on developing things. A lot of mining companies are not necessarily going to develop new technology. They'll use exactly what they've got now, and they'll wait for METS companies to go and spend the money to develop something to put into their plant. Um, yeah, MIM, when I worked for MIM, they were in the business of developing technologies, but now that Glencore owns Mount Isa Mines, Glencore are not interested in developing technology. They want to mine stuff and sell it. Um, so, you know, the funding model, it, it's difficult there's a number of things you can do. You can have one-on-one -on -one projects with, with, with universities on specific topics that you want to have an answer to. Uh, they can work quite well. Um, if for something bigger, uh, and I know with Amira P260, there was a lot of work on try, trying to depress pyrite 
um, probably never really solved the problem, but people learnt a lot from it and there was a lot of collaboration. Um, it just depends on the size of the problem and how critical it is. Once you get a project up and running, you, there has to be interaction between the researchers and the miners or, and, and the METS companies, but a lot of us haven't got a lot of time to sit down and read the reports, attend the meetings, um, so sometimes it can be the researchers driving the project because the, the, the sponsors of the project never show up or they do show up and give cursory glances at things and make off-the-cuff statements. Um, I don't know how to solve that um, because a lot of the solutions that come out of universities are actually quite critical to their operations and can improve their productivity. Um, we hear, hear a lot in the news at the moment about wages growth but no productivity growth. The government and I guess the unions would like productivity growth because that drives wages increases. But people just don't have time. Um, funding is an issue, but getting the right people, particularly on the industry side, to drive the projects is also an issue. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. If you haven't got the right people in the right places to drive the research from an industry perspective that's going to be uh, hugely beneficial for the industry, it's pretty much a non-event. Just uh, adding a quick comment, um, I think from the, the, the various uh, f funding mechanisms I've seen over the years, what was set up here with this PRIF mining consortium should be looked at as a, a very good model. So I think uh, we shouldn't forget that. Um, I guess it's predominantly, you know, acknowledging the, the, the three different, the, the end user mining companies, the, the METS companies and the researchers. Um, a lot, like, like Chris said, a lot of what the METS companies need to put in is in-kind contribution. Um, and then using, you know, the end users who ha have the direct benefit funding and, 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 and government funding to, to, I guess, fill in the gaps. So I think that model and acknowledging the three different roles and, and the way that was all, you know, from, from the start of the, this mining consortium, the, the way that was all designed and sold was... Um, very good. Um. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that comment from Ben. Um, I feel like <clears throat> this is a big topic and uh, I've probably got a little bit more to say about it in my, um, my presentation a little later. But the, the idea of uh, contract research has never been um, appealing to me. That's, that's going to a university to, to do a research job and you know, a, a company like a METS company pays for that research. Um, I equally feel like miners and universities uh, uh, won't be successful in that type of endeavour either. Um, my, my perspective is probably biased here, but it's, it's much better having a METS company in the middle simply because the successful commercialisation of the problem becomes an existential issue for the METS company, not the university or the miner. So you make it someone's problem and that drives commercialisation. Um, from the METS perspective, you've always got technical staff in your company that are fully loaded, fully loaded up with, with work to do and a roadmap to execute on. And there's a long tail of things that don't make the roadmap. So if something new comes in, it has to have a mechanism to get above the threshold where it actually gets worked on. And one of the um, attractive things is if there's a, a dollar value leverage, and a lot of the grant schemes are you know, based around this concept, um, <clears throat> certainly if the METS company puts in a certain amount of money and it can be shown that that money will be matched dollar for dollar, or even at a, at a better ratio with some university funds or some ARC funds, 
that makes an attractive business case inside the Mets company uh, far better, far beyond just what I'd call the, the contract research model. So I'm, I was uh, reflecting that by ensuring that the value chain's there and if the goal is commercializing, by having METs, you have the people whose core business it is to get a service or product to market. And you have the research performed by people whose core business it is to do that and end users whose core business it is to mine. Um, I, I think when we're talking about research instruments, one of the things that, that um, I think we should reflect on is if we look at another way we tried to evolve the PRIF was through the Copper for Tomorrow CRC bid and thank everybody here for their effort. It was one of the, the six bids that went through to stage two um, with strong support of many in the room. Um, now, so the bid team did what it could because it gets scored in stage one. Then stage two is an interview and there's a decision that's made. And it was in a, a, a year, as it turns out, that only two were awarded. And that meant that the success rate for a cooperative research center that year was under what a success rate for a center of excellence would have been. And that uncertainty and the fact that the copper for tomorrow um, had to keep developing itself over an entire year because of a decision to um, not have a cooperative research center round run an entire year generates a lot of uncertainty that's difficult for any of us to deal with, irrespective of what sector we're in. I guess the reflection I have is that bid went to um, stage one with a, just over $16 million in cash commitments, not even the in-kind. Um, and I know you don't like the word entrepreneurs, but if we were entrepreneurs and had $16 million on the table, why would we say we only run with it if one other investor puts in another 16 million. I don't get it. And if we believe in ourselves and we back ourselves, let's find a way to recreate this, whether or not there's a stamp from a government entity. And to me, that's how we take the uncertainty out of research, is by deciding what we're going to do together and simply funding it together. Peter Munro, not last year, the year before in his Del Pratt lecture, indicated that mining companies should actually fund a lot of this research. You know, they, they make, well, you look at iron ore, um, he called it uh, red cocaine. Um, they, they're making huge profits at the moment. Why can't they take a small percentage of that, you know, maybe half a percent, and then invest that into research within universities. Um, it doesn't have to all come from government. I mean, these people make, and I guess my company makes a lot of money as well, but if you want to have advances, you've actually got to pay for it. It doesn't come for free. It doesn't fall out of the sky and hit you in the head. It usually comes from a lot of hard work, and it come, you need money to support the research efforts. Going to a mining company and begging for funds is, uh, it, it's, it's almost like they, they don't want to improve. If they want to improve, they should be willing to invest in, in a small proportion of what they make in supporting the development of new ideas which will improve their performance. Some thought-provoking statements there. I know everybody's now racing to go to lunch, but just one last question. Um, research infrastructure in Adelaide, addressing the mining sector, um, the two universities now getting together. Is this going to be a case of one plus one equals three? Um, what are the panel's thoughts about new and improved facilities uh, to really stay competitive um, in, in the mineral sector in Adelaide compared to our colleagues on the on the East Coast and indeed on, on the West Coast. Um, what could we actually do, propose, especially during this sort of merger phase to, to really strengthen what we can offer? Pilot facilities. Right. Um, yeah, if, I think 
Queensland are looking at putting in some money into building some sort of mineral processing pilot facilities to, I think they're looking at rare earths and other things. Um, I, I, could I build on that, Chris? So we know that work integrated learning is going to be essential to our new university and getting back to pilot facilities. Um, is there a way to put those on campus together with company people and the students are able to interact with those consistently throughout the week rather than have to go to sites somewhere else? Um, because we don't have any mines near enough for students to go to in that two hour gap between when their studies are. Um, and that means that if you do work integrated learning, and this could also be part of it, they will have to leave and go, go off site. And that's fine, that's a great experience, but what can we do together on the new campus that, that would really help us push the edge of what companies need? So, <clears throat> Michael, um, I, I, think, I think we do. I mean, we, we have, we have Terramen at Strathalbyn, we have um, Camman 2, Copper Mine, that um, if there was some effort put into keeping those mines sustaining, at least as pilot operable sites, I think you've got just a beautiful lab there for all manner of <coughs> things. And um, it's, it's probably <coughs> no secret that um, MapTech has used um, Hillgrove Camman 2 mine for, for testing many of its technologies as they are refined and go to market and we we found that a an enormous uh, asset and um, it's going to be a, a sad day when that reaches the end of its um, mine life teaching i mean when, when i did my degree way, way back in the dim dark recesses of time you know most of my class i'd worked on mines for about three years before I went and got my degree, but most of my colleagues had no idea what a ball mill looked like. Um, you don't have to teach in a classroom. You go take them to a mine site, do all the right occupational health and safety stuff, but you can actually to do a lot by doing hand, not necessarily directly hands on, but taking them through a plant, taking them through a mine, to learn about what their craft in the future is going to be. You break out of the normal mindset of university where you rock up at nine o'clock and listen to some boring old fart drone on for 40 minutes and then try to stay awake and then you go down the bar. I mean, it's probably an exaggeration, but I mean, take, take the learning experience out of the classroom and, the, you know, BV or Amdel, BV now. You've got a good facility out at Wingfield. We've got a reasonable lab in Wingfield, but there are other people in the in the area that could help with their education. From that, you can probably expand into postgraduate research as well. I think that's that's really what I wanted to hear. I, mean, I think there are opportunities. It's not only the big mining companies that are eight hours away and it can be incredibly difficult to get on site unless you're willing to do a week's worth of inductions and all the rest of it. I, I do a week's worth of inductions probably every three weeks. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, when I was a, a student, you, you would get to visit mines at all, I mean, very, very easily. And even, I'm even thinking here, um, 2009 when I arrived here in Australia, we would do trips up to, to Prom Hill, Olympic Dam, everything in three or four days and then every, everybody would get on site and see everything. It's just not possible now to do that. Just sad in a way. All right, I think everybody's getting hungry. Uh, we are after one o'clock now, well after one o'clock. So I think let's um, break for lunch and we're gonna break until quarter to two. Um, so lunch is gonna be served outside. So uh, please enjoy. Um, enjoy the opportunity to chat with one another and uh, we'll see you in here at quarter to two.